Noon on Thursday, folks. Ted Rawson here with our show, Where the, Road, Where the Drone Leads, at uh, Think Tech OE Studios. Pardon my uh, forgetting what the show was, uh, was named. It's been two weeks since we've done this show. Marg and I were down in New Zealand uh, in our own ways, uh, leaving quite an impression on New Zealand. And uh, as a result, we had uh, uh, two dark weeks the last week with no show. And anyway, we were back on and welcoming on uh, one of our frequent flyers and friends in uh, San Francisco, John Mullen of Fromia Inc. John, you there? Hello, yes. How you doing? Okay, pretty good, John. There you are. And uh, with the change of time in our show to noon on Thursday, we actually get you in the core hours of your business, which is kind of a nice break from uh, asking folks to stick around after closing hours, uh, as we have done before. Anyway, uh, we've had John on many times talking about uh, various aspects of droneism. And the one that's really interesting going on right now is a sort of a combination of the counter drone efforts going on, drone identification, and how this all plays into the larger game of evolving cyber uh, operations and cybersecurity. Now, untangling all that, uh, and this is new information, John, just came out this week. Uh, FAA uh, has uh, put in, in a high, very high priority the creation of a system that will give an electronic signature uh, outputting from every drone that's flying, uh, probably like an AIS on board ship uh, or uh, uh, ADSB out on airplanes, something like that. Some form of uh, electronic identification, electronic fingerprint identification of the drone, the operator, uh, other information that uh, will come to, into the front here. So every drone will be putting that out on an RF signal. Uh, sometime here, I don't know when it'll start. The design work is going on now. A uh, number of options that exist that would uh, provide that. That really changes the whole picture on our counter drone work. And uh, I wanted just to reflect that back to you in, in terms of thinking about how that does influence our counter drone work. Your thoughts? Sure. Sure. Well, um, one of the things is the, the different kinds of RF frequencies that the drones use. and. If, if we are countering commercial drones, then we can assume the unlicensed bands, the standard 2.4, 5.8 sorts of bands. Um, but if we are uh, uh, assuming there may be terrorists or homegrown or military drones, then it's different. So the, um, it'll be interesting to see which band and what's the regulatory requirement for the identification, uh, because that will probably mean uh, additional RF uh, capabilities on drones. Um, so, because not all of them are going to be able to uh, communicate in all in all components. So, maybe the next step will also be standardization of ground control uh, RF frequencies. You know, who knows, right? Well, that's right. And in fact, RTCA is working on that very subject, the whole issue of spectrum and RF uh, management for drones. And we don't hear much about them. It's kind of a clandestine operation over there in DOC. But this whole notion of now putting out a, a fingerprint identification tag, electronic, uh, on your drone, also leads to a lot of uh, social issues in terms of, uh, okay, who's allowed to know that I'm flying a drone if I'm flying a drone? And uh, exactly That's right. what, <laughs> what information do I put in there? And uh, uh, I, I think ideally it would get down to the point where a, a uh, cell phone app of some kind would be able to perceive the, that signal coming down so that uh, law enforcement, public safety people, fire fighters and such could gain that knowledge and go figure out what's going on and go cor correct the situation if there's a situation that uh, isn't correct. Uh, however, uh, I don't think we have anything like this out there. We have license plates on cars, which just are reflective. Uh, we have uh, uh, license plates on bikes, motorcycles, and such, and name uh, address on our house and our mailbox. We don't really have anything that I'm thinking of that, that I can be aware of that's electronic that puts out a lot of information identifying who we are, what we are. Airplanes and ships do, of course, but in our common life, we don't have that sort of thing. Well, even, even sailboats, large sailboats will, but then there's always been the issue of people faking that. <laughs> they've, they've been spoofing that for a long time. And then if you know the, uh, the, the freighters, so the big oil tankers, uh, because of the cost of licensing at the ports, uh, over the years you've caught many times you'd have like seven or eight Liberian freighters in different parts of the world all with the same name and all with the same number so that uh, they didn't have to pay seven different fees, you know. So there's been a lot of, uh, 
<laughs> a lot of games played with this, and there can be. And like you say, somebody could pick it up and, and know who's flying that drone. Or, And then also, as you know, if you get up on the Internet and you start to look at who's hacking things, uh, almost any kind of um, frequency can be hacked by that software-defined radio, and there's videos showing how to hack into police bands and how to hack into cell phones and how to hack anything, uh, garage door openers, you know. So I'm sure that'll be coming too. So all those things are happening. But by and large, I think the majority of people will do it right, um, hopefully, right? I think so. I think the, the, what we'll find is, is the people who simply purchase them and, and use them without proper knowledge are going to be identified. That's a good thing. Uh, people who are willing malicious agents who are manufacturing their own and putting in their own uh, command and control systems, they're not going to do it. Uh, so the, the, uh, the, by and large, the, the, the bulk of the public that's, that's using these today will be protected and identified. Uh, obviously, still we have the issue of the serious malicious uh, offenders and such, and I think our work in counter drone uh, continues because we're going to still need to sort those issues out. Definitely, certainly, and and those are maybe the worst, you know. So uh, there's certainly nuisance with the public and and you know press events and things like that. But but the guys that are really coming after you to do real damage are are not, as you know. So but, uh, right, they're not going to cooperate. They don't cooperate today. So I well, they might they might cooperate to fake it. You see, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, but but then level. again, if you take the even the civil side where everything is working fine and, and you just expand how many drones there could be and how many reports could be going on, you could think of a like a weather map of the U.S. where all the activity is going on. And uh, you get some interesting patterns and trends, I think, out of that, which would, I suppose would be useful to somebody. But uh, it, it, it does, once again, beg the question of... Uh, of uh, exactly how far does this want to go in terms of identification and who gets access to it? How can that access be controlled? And if it's an RF signal, it, access is there, right? It, it, you really can't limit well, it unless it's encrypted. Yeah, it, well, that's true. But look at what happens with, with uh, license plates. Uh, you can see the license plate, ABC123. Uh, that doesn't mean you get to know that person's name or address. Uh, a long time ago, you could actually look that up, a long time ago in California, but uh, but for a long time, you haven't been able to. They, they restrict access. So there are ways you can still have a readable identity string that police can see and other people can't identify. And um, I think the drones have to be compared to cars because it's the only thing I can think of that is so pervasive and ubiquitous that's going to be everywhere. Uh, and then you've got license issues, you've got safety issues, you've got legal issues, you've got identification issues, you got, and those are all handled, and we have a template for doing that in every every aspect of the cars. So I think at least from a mental point of view, that's a, a way to go after it. Well, that's great. So, so people have been faking that, uh, license plates too, and but that doesn't mean it happens that often, but it does happen. And so uh, as this thing evolves, uh, that was all the wind up. Here's the delivery. Uh, would you like to be involved consulting on this uh, particular subject? From the perspective of cybersecurity and such, as this as this notion evolves, well, certainly. Okay. Certainly. Yeah, no doubt about it. But like like you said, the devil's in the details, and it's often with the humans, not the technology. Oh, right. <laughs> Policy, okay. you know, and and uh, enforcement. But yeah, great, no doubt about it. It has to be done, and it's a uh, it's critical. So anyway, that's kind of a, a really interesting piece of news here that uh, we've all uh, been wondering how it's going to happen. And frankly, I don't know what the motivation was in Congress or in the FAA that, that generated this, this need. I mean, all, we all can see it, but there has to be some forcing function, some, uh, some uh, orders written and this sort of thing to uh, take it into an action. And I, I wish I knew more about it than that. It kind of snuck up on us all. And I was uh, surprised to find this out this, this week. But I'll, we'll see if we can do it to get involved uh, through you on the, on the advisory aspects of this because I think uh, the work that you do would be really useful as, uh, as this uh, functionality comes around. Yeah, there are Bluetooth, you know, on some drones, and, and, and phones have Bluetooth. So that's kind of on your way to doing what you said earlier, the, the police identifying. So that is one, one potential. Okay. And then that then leads to the larger issue of drones and as a component within the larger cyber network. Now if we can find them all, or at least those that are cooperative, 
now we have a, a new addition to the picture of, of uh, interactivity in the country. We have uh, this new picture. And one could look at that as one could look at uh, any aspect like disease or any other thing that has a pattern, has a growth rate, and it has uh, vectors and such in it. One could begin to see patterns of how this all works. And it, it sort of knocks on the door of cyber, uh, it, to me anyway. And uh, it puts drones in a place where their involvement with the power grid, for example, or with the infrastructure, uh, those kind of patterns could be identified and recognized. And um, perhaps there's a function there in terms of defining where uh, adverse activity is taking place, even in a cooperative sense. That is, if you're making movies, uh, and you're using drones to record the, the footage and such, you certainly don't want to have somebody else out there with his drone recording that same movie uh, for free. Uh, or if you're fighting a fire, or if you're make, maintaining your power lines and this sort of thing, or seeding corn in your field, uh, that's your business, not somebody else's business. So in some way, there's a, uh, there's a, a, a piece here that can come up in terms of uh, uh, identifying whether any adverse patterns are occurring, even again with people who are cooperating in terms of the RF signature. Sure. Well, if you look at the way the FAA worked all along, and you know this much better than I do, they really assigned responsibility to the pilots because the pilots kind of were, were the light these and they were the ones who did it. And if you look at the last couple of years, there's been rules that you can't fly a drone, a commercial drone anyway, unless you've got a pilot's license. And I think as you said earlier, let's find out what drone this is, and then also who's flying it. And now you've got a chain of responsibility, you see, and you also have a license capability. You've got a fine capability. You've got a, you can pull their license. You've got all sorts of things if you go in this direction. Well, so, you know, uh, but I agree with you about the cyber mapping, you know, keeping people, a lot of it also is the noise, especially the quadcopters are so loud. They interrupt religious ceremonies, as you know, there in Hawaii. and and uh, other things. So there's lots of different dimensions. Um, I, I think when you said earlier about a, a temporary, like you could put up, I, I'm going to hold this space, this square mile for the next uh, uh, four hours or two days, and I don't want any drones coming there. Well, the, the right kind of network could handle that yeah. and could <clears throat> keep people out of that. So I think that's going to be something that is uh on the kind of on the fringe of, uh, of, of people's rights and such, but I think it's important. And I think that uh, a power company for sure, uh, a, a uh, petroleum plant, uh, a hospital for example, anything, it should really find a way to define its own territory and it, it should at least know what's going on there, let alone patrol it and protect it. So that is so, somewhere between cyber and operations. But I, I think we'll see that capability coming forth once we have this, this, uh, this indicator coming down. The next one I immediately think about is how high. You get huh. the right kind of drone up, uh, you know, 2,000 feet with a good camera. Nobody knows that the drone's up there, but he's taking all the pictures. So, you know, I know that, what, is there a limit? I, I guess there's a 200 foot uh, limit and then there's a couple of them, but. Well, look at, look at, that's a really interesting point. I'm glad you brought that up. We'll get back to that after our break here. But I wanted to bring up, uh, that aspect of expectations that people have, and uh, also the point you made about the FAA using aviation thinking as a framework here, and, uh, and talk about those after we get back from our break. Hi, I'm Carol Cox. I'm the new host of Eyes on Hawaii. Make sure you stay in the know on Hawaii. Join us on Tuesdays at 12 noon. We will see you then. Aloha. Freedom. Is it a feeling? Is it a place? Is it an idea? At Dive Heart, we believe freedom is all of these and more, regardless of your ability. Dive Heart wants to help you escape the bonds of this world and defy gravity. Since 2001, Dive Heart has helped children, adults, and veterans of all abilities go where they have never gone before. Dive Heart has helped them transition to their new normal. Search DiveHeart.org and share our mission with others, and in the process, help people of all abilities imagine the possibilities in their lives. You're watching ThinkTech on ThinkTechHawaii.com, which broadcasts five live talk shows from noon to 5 p.m. every weekday, and then streams our earlier shows all night long. Great content for Hawaii from ThinkTech. 
It is afternoon on Thursday now, folks. Ted Ralston here in the Think Tech Studios downtown, the second half of our show where the drone leads as we spin the show back up after two weeks of uh, no show. Uh, with me uh, from San Francisco coming in by Skype is John Mullen, CEO of uh, Promia, a, a leading company that thinks through the really hard and complex problems of cybersecurity. Uh, and John, welcome aboard again. Thank you. And just before break, we were talking about two really interesting subjects. One was the, we got into the privacy issue, which we don't often get into, but I think it's important that we do that here. The second is, uh, we'll talk about first, is the, the, the really cleverness FAA has used in turning drones into a component of aviation. And in my view, it goes this way. Uh, by having a, getting an airman certificate, which is what you get when you're a drone operator these days, it's an airman certificate. It puts you into that class called airmen who are supposed to have uh, full knowledge, full understanding, and full responsibility and full liability for operating your equipment in the national airspace. And uh, un unlike the other categories of operation where a lot of specific rules and, rules and codes and limitations are provided, uh, in the drone world, it's really up to you to understand what risks are facing you and mitigate all of them. And uh, uh, as a result, there are no, or there are very few, hard and fast rules. It's basically your uh, obligation to understand whatever it might be and mitigate against that. And that puts the responsibility totally on the operator. And also, if you were to uh, fail in that obligation, you get your license taken away, your certificate taken away, and you can't operate. So it's a real strong motivation to understand what that means. But this isn't something that we train or teach in, in the normal parts of our life. We learn how to drive a car, we have certain rules, speed limits, and the car stays on the road and things like that. But the total picture of what uh, issues you might be getting into in a car are, are, are so controlled by rules that you don't really have this decision-making process you have to go through like you do in drones. But you mentioned 400 feet before the break. Uh, 400 feet, who's going to measure 400 feet? You know, there's issues that come up that, uh, uh, that, um, that that, that test your ability to really process uh, potential faults and such. We're doing some work adjacent to an airport out here in Hawaii. Actually, we're permitted to operate near an airport because it's Class G airspace. However, logic would say, we really need to make sure we've talked to everybody who operates at that airport and understand all the deviations they might go through because those are possible things that would occur and we have to pre-mitigate against those as opposed to just asserting our right. So I think that's maybe the difference. In aviation, you mitigate and you think through very carefully and eliminate all faults rather than assert your way through. And asserting our way through is how we conduct ourselves and most of the rest of our business and our life. So that's a change that uh, people are gonna have to think about. And I, I bring that up to you because uh, uh, the issue of maintaining your correct electronic signature on this electronic downlink is going to be something that uh, you're obligated to do as a drone operator. And it, of course, sets the stage for somebody who isn't performing properly to be have his license pulled. And I think more than the license pulled, just like in uh, driving down the street, you can either have criminal things where you do something wrong that hurts someone else uh, or that breaks the flat law, or you can have civil torts and uh, civil wrongs committed with no contract, which is a, a, another sort of exposure. So it's not just losing your license. And once they know who you are and they can demonstrate you did this or you didn't do that, then there is more exposure. And, and unfortunately, that's not a very good way to govern or have policy. But as you pointed out, that's what we have to do here because uh, every situation is different and you have to mitigate the, the poss possibilities. So um, the more we can make these devices automatically do certain behaviors, the easier that's going to be. But uh, we're on our way, still yeah. still early. It's a great partnership between the technical teams who have to go forward and make things uh, perform correctly under ASTM and under RTCA, and then the operators who have to learn this new way of thinking. There was a case, the case law actually is where all these things start coming up, right? That's where, where reality occurs. And the first one of big record uh, was in the Seattle and it was just uh, announced a couple of weeks ago. Some video photographer was doing a parade with a drone 
lost control of it. The drone hit a building, and drone parts came down on the parade crowd and injured two people. Uh, and so in that case, uh, the operator was uh, found, um, they hadn't mitigated the potential risks of his drone hitting a building, hadn't figured out how to do that or what to do about it, and was therefore liable. And uh, I think he's got a year and $10,000 plus uh, medical costs that he has to take care of right now. I'm sure it's being, being um, contested, but that, that was the starting point. So we'll see that more. But then the other piece you mentioned, um, uh, a noise and uh, disruptions and such, I, I think part of what that guy, ha that operator has to understand is what the rules are, or the expectations the public has of their privacy and their rights and their their rights to not no, to no disturbance, their rights to no observation. And um, so that'll be a factor as well. The FAA won't take care of that. That's on the, on the civil side, I think, where, where that sort of issue, issue will come up. But uh, yeah, to the extent that you express yourself in public today, whatever that limitation or that freedom is you have is, is how you define yourself by your external expression and observation, that can't be altered by drones. So uh, observation, listening, uh, irritating, penetrating, all those things are, are uh, a deviation from that and then would be a cause for, a, for a action under uh, uh, various forms of um, uh, civil rights or, or, uh, or privacy invasion. Yeah, it, I don't know how many times you've been hiking up in the mountains and had somebody walk by with a uh, very loud uh, music blasting as they're hiking up in the mountains. It's it's kind of irritating. I mean that that's something you you're not gonna you're, you're not gonna litigate. You're not gonna you know call the police. But it's uh, usually you just talk to somebody and say put your headsets on or something. Then then you can listen to your music and I can listen to quiet. Right. So, but it's uh, it's something that has to be worked through. There's that. Right? Yeah. And and uh, certainly. Uh... Uh, the the boombox in the in the mountain is a situation, and actually, interesting enough, in, in Hawaii here, the state of the city parks have uh, have rules on on decibels of uh, recorded music and uh, musical instruments and all this sort of thing. So that issue has been addressed at least in the parks, and I suppose it could be extended to the mountains if we if we had a, a serious issue there. But I think even even the drones, even with regulations and such, there's still going to be that gray area between when something is actually is prosecuted versus just try to get somebody to get somebody to cooperate sure well I hope the drones get quieter how's that <laughs> <laughs> yeah well I, I hope they do too I was uh, yeah I, I've we've actually my wife and I have been uh, have, have, have had that experience already and uh, it isn't uh, you know you kind of wonder what who's up what's what's going on here what uh, and I really want that ID tag so I can look at my cell phone app and figure out who it is and go and talk to them yeah, yeah. So. The vertical takeoff landing, the, the fixed wings seem to be quieter and longer. Those quadcopters are the buzzy ones from my, my experience. Yeah, in plain old aerodynamics, that's uh, propulsive lift is always a lot noisier, burns a lot more fuel, and is about one-fifth the efficiency of wing-borne operations. So there's the factor right there, and that turns into, to, into, uh, into tip speed on the props and turns into power consumption, and that turns into noise. So it all, all fits. But you're right, they are. And some of them some of them are really noisy, and yeah. I mean, uh, you can hear them at 100 feet without any problem. Yeah, I, I, I wish they would uh, copy owl's wings so you can't even hear them at all. Ah. My, uh, my expertise. So make them into That's what I would like. But yeah. I, I think we're a long ways away from a Bernoulli type of uh, flappable wing on a, on, a, on a mechanical device. So John, the other, the other subject we often talk about is uh, cybersecurity and, and trends and such that are going on there. Again, we talked about the role of drones as being an input to the cyber system and maybe even a corrective measure when, when, we, when we think of uh, discovering, in, discovering information and such. But in terms of the general uh, uh, processing of cybersecurity and the emergence of uh, quantum computing as such, uh, what, what do you see going on here in that, in that future? Well, quantum is a major, I think my humble opinion, it's the biggest um, change in computing since the original computing machine, since the original digital machines. I think, uh, and you know, there's been many, many advances in computers, but this is more than any of the other, in my opinion. This is but, a bigger scale effect than, the, than going from analog to digital in the first place? I think so. I this think so. It's, it's very strange, and I think many 
uh, people who are currently in the business of uh, computing are not going to be able to make the shift. Uh, the operating environment is, is very odd. The programming environment is very odd. The operational environment, the networking environment is very odd. So um, it's going to be a whole different world. But and that's, that's definitely one piece of it. And the, the reason that people usually give for the, the immediate knee-jerk reason is because of the speed of these machines uh, to solve simultaneous mathematical problems. They can crack crypto readily. That's, that's the theory, and it's being proven now. Uh, and then if you, if you have two of these uh, quantum machines that are talking to each other, then their crypto link is supposed to be very close to being unbreakable. So, so if you're asynchronous, where you have one uh, trying to attack our current computers, it's, uh, it's no, no battle at all. And then if you have two of them, then... Uh, so that, that's, that's very important as far as all of this goes. Um, you know, and then also the whole thing about jamming and the electronic uh, warfare. I, I think those two, electronic warfare and cyber, are, are melding very quickly here, where you've got the RF signals as well as the data inside those RF signals and uh, different layers. So we're going to see a wholesale change in, in, in thinking, and that has to come first, and then followed by programming, and followed by applications. You can't even imagine what they are at this point in time. Can you? There's yeah. going to be generated well, kind of, by this. You, you kind of think of holographs uh, <laughs> instead of talking to each other, instead of video like we're doing right now, yeah. being able to see and move and touch around. I mean, there's certainly that, but that's only on the very sh shadow scale. I mean, you know, when you're dealing with different kinds of mathematics, you deal in many, many, uh, uh, many, many dimensions uh, and many, many unknowns, not just three, four, five, seven, ten, fifteen, but hundreds. And uh, so that's kind of where we're going with this stuff. So the um, world of modeling and simulation then could take a, a shot in the arm uh, in this direction as well. Definitely. And that, that's all the good stuff. But because I do defense a lot, I, I think of the bad stuff. And so uh, in that way, you don't need a whole lot of people to know how to do things. You just need one bad person that knows how to do certain things and you've got a problem. So, you know, those are the things I kind of gravitate towards. But you're right. As far as the upside goes, it's, it's, there's no, uh, no boundaries, it seems. One of the things I've been thinking about for a long time, and others have been too, is some kind of a virtual test range that would be useful for examining really complex systems like 500 drones over Honolulu, for example. How is that going to work? And uh, there's so many variations, so many variables, and uh, so many variances that need to be accom accommodated. It's, not, it's beyond the ability to think through it in a linear fashion. So, Modeling and simulation would be useful in examining how this whole drone world is going to be uh, forthcoming. And I think the uh, quantum computing would create the framework that would allow that high level of variation to be accommodated in modeling. What are you thoughts on that? Certainly, no doubt about it. I think that's why I gravitate always to the RF because generally you have 500 drones, but they're in one or two spectrums. Even if they're skipping, even if they're uh, split spectrum, with spectrum, you still can focus on them and you get one kind of control point for all of them. Uh, but as you say, if they're all in different and they're in different areas at different times, then boy, it's a total uh, you know, crapshoot, I guess. <laughs> so we have to design a system that accommodates that. And I think the only way to design it is going to be with really intense modeling and simulation that, that can represent these 500 different individual actors. In, right interacting and communicating or not, even with malicious input or rain coming through, for example, or something like that. There's a, there's a lot of functionality that this emerging world of quantum computing will give us in the, on the good side. I take it back to when uh, the, what we used to call mini computers first came out, because I was yeah. working with the mainframes a long time ago, and then uh, we started to see the PDP 1170s and the Digital Equipment Corporation and some of these things, but they were only used in, in risk-based machines. They were only really used for scientific calculations, because that's how they, their Fourier, that's their forte, and how they actually did things. Whereas the, the the bigger mainframes were more business machines, moving data from one place to another. And I think that's where these quantums are going to come out first: is scientific processes of uh, weather weather pattern, uh, water in a pipe, or water on the ocean, or you know the complex things with many, many, many variables. And we'll think that's of, where they play very well. And the cool thing there is that with that kind of a capability, we can we can accommodate 
millions of drones out there collecting information, feeding into the system and getting that oceanography picture, that uh, bathymetry picture, that coastal geology picture in a big, gigantic way. That's right. And, and also, as you have the submersible drones, uh, you get it layers down to the uh -huh. bottom. So tie, tie them together. The yeah. Okay. Well, John, thanks so much for coming on as we got this show started again here. And uh, uh, we're at the end of our half hour. But uh, I'd like to suggest that the next time we have a new piece of information, like either something of the equivalent of uh, quantum technology or quantum computing or the electronic fingerprint, we bring you back on again and see what that's going to do to the future of drones and how these all tie together into the cyber network. Looking forward to it. Okay, John. Thank you. Thanks a lot. See you all next uh, Thursday.